Hi, this is a presentation on how it is to operate a scale model ballast water treatment system that was designed by me, Thomas Alper, uh, for U.S. Geological Survey, working with Gavin Sari. Um, so the, the intent of a scale model system is very much the same as, say, a scale model airplane or car and wind tunnel is to produce a low cost model that can be used as a representation of a larger scale model or a larger full scale, we'll say, uh, prototype system. In this case, we built a 124th scale model to model a full scale ballast tank. And to give you a little background on the topic, shipping vessels, uh, also known as Lakers, the, the freight vessels that move throughout the Great Lakes are often um, have, uh, assigned, you could say, to pick up cargo at one port, let's say somewhere in Duluth, Minnesota, or something like that, maybe some iron ore, taconite, things like that, and move it over to maybe one of the foundries over in Lake Erie or something like that. And the problem that uh, they create is that in the process of, say, uh, unloading cargo at one port, they pick up ballast water, uh, the water kind of shown over here, uh, being ejected at, at a certain point, and in so doing, they may pick up microorganisms that, that can proliferate throughout uh, unaffected water bodies. Ballast tanks themselves are intended to control the balance or the buoyancy, you could say, of uh, these ocean go or these lake or going vessels that prevents them from tipping over when they're unloaded. And it just gives them greater stability when they're under um, unsavory sailing conditions. And it also reduces the hydrostatic stresses that are applied to the hull of the ship when it's uh, got a hard uh, cargo in it uh, that could cause it to kind of collapse inward. So uh, ballast tanks can introduce aquatic nuisance species. It's estimated up to 60% of aquatic nuisance invasives are introduced by ballast water, which as we can see in the uh, four phases of loading, unloading cargo shown here, uh, we've got the situation where the ship discharges cargo, basically its weight reduces, and it would tend to float high on the water, which would actually cause its metacentric height to uh, exceed its, its center of buoyancy and risk the possibility of tipping in high winds or stormy seas. So they fill it with ballast water to basically keep the hull of the boat at a reasonable level such that it won't tip. And as we saw earlier, as the ballast, uh, as the ship goes from one port to another, the ballast water that they draw up in one port gets carried to the next port down wherever it's going to be delivered. And then as it's loading cargo in the new port, it uh, offloads the ballast tank, uh, the ballast water in the ballast tanks and runs the risk of discharging a variety of organisms that could affect the new ecosystem, whether it's fish or crustaceans or uh, bacteria, fungi, what, what have you. And so this process has actually caused the introduction of several aquatic invasive species already. And the intent of this work and specific, is to prevent further introduction of such an invasive species. So uh, Dr. Gavin Sari uh, suggested or proposed a method whereby when the ballast tanks of the Lakers are being filled with water, uh, the water itself would be infused with a pisicide known as antimycin A uh, during the filling process. And then during transport to the next location, it would be treated with a neutralizer, uh, and we propose potassium permanganate before being discharged into the new uh, estuary port, uh, wherever it's delivering its cargo. So we looked around and we found some typical Laker vessels, in this case, the Edwin Gott, uh, photographed here, that would serve as a representation of the types of ballast vessels, um, ballast tanks uh, that would be used in the Great Lakes freighters. So um, I was able to obtain the blueprints of the Edwin Gott from the manufacturer of the ship. Uh, I think these blueprints came from the 1970s or so. And I went through the drawings and found uh, the largest ballast tanks. Uh, the reason we'd select the largest ballast tanks is because they pose the largest challenge to treat the water for, uh, uniformly.
uh, not only with the anti-mycin during the filling process, but also the potassium permanganate neutralizer during the uh, after the uh, microorganisms are killed and before it's being discharged in the new port. So what we see here is a profile view of the ship and then a top view of the ships showing that it has six ballast tanks, all with uh, volumes of about 1.8 million gallons each. And they just name them number two, number three, number four. And then there's the number twos on the port, the starboard, uh, number three, and number four, so on and so forth. So uh, the ballast tank that we made is a scale model of these and whether it's, it's really quite um, um, in, unconcerning which of these it is, it's just we wanted to select a ballast tank that's representative of the most challenging situation. Now taking a cutaway view from the interior of the ship, we can see at least for the Edwin Gop, the ballast tanks are positioned on the left and right hand side of the cargo hold, which is in the middle. And underneath the cargo hold, there's some clearance areas where the existing piping network, if this were the cross section of, pi of the pipe, goes into place and where additional piping uh, could be used. So for the ballast tank, you'll see in a moment, the reason that all the pipes are located on the lower half, more or less the lower third of the tank, is because there's limited locations where we can actually put additional piping. And the exterior wall of the model ballast tank you'll see has a plexiglass sheet for you know viewing from the outside. And the inside of the um, the inside of the model ballast tank actually has some pipelines, and then the pumps are actually located on top. Uh, but the piping itself is all located in this lower section here. So the model ballast tank is designed to perform the two functions proposed by Dr. Sari, one of which is to just fill the ballast tank as already occurs with the existing Lakers, and then the other is to inject anti-mycin A at the time that it's filling. So this is kind of a simplified representation on the right showing what would be the large pump which would draw water from a reservoir representing the, um, the water that's just present in the port at which the tank begins to be filled. And then the second pump here would represent a smaller pump used to infuse the inflowing water uh, from the, to fill the ballast tank with the antimycin A or whatever uh, pyocyte is, is regarded as necessary there. So, there's really about three or two phases to the process. One is filling the tank with the pyocyte, and then the other is neutralizing the pyocyte with what's referred to as the recirculation loop. Now, the recirculation loop has, as shown here in both the green and blue uh, boxes, the blue box here would represent a similarly sized pump to the filling pump shown there. And then the smaller blue box would represent a similarly sized pump to the antimycin. But in this case, um, this would be the recirculation pump, the large blue box. And then the um, neutralizer pump is represented by the smaller blue box there. They pressurize water into the so-called recirculation loop, which isn't shown fully here. But essentially what it does is the closed loop. So a portion of it draws water in from the already full tank. So we would say that the tank has been filled, the antimycin has already been injected, it's performing its intended effect on the uh, micro or the organisms contained within the tank. And then when it's time to neutralize the antimycin, uh, this blue pump here is turned on, it draws water from the tank, uh, basically pulls it in and re-injects it through any combination of these 12 uh, injection nozzles listed here. Now, we don't have to run all 12 nozzles at once. We'll look into various combinations of those nozzles, but for present time, we could just say that there's two separate fluid systems, one of which is for filling and administering antimycin, the other of which is for recirculating the fluid in the tank and administering the potassium permanganate. And I should add, um, the recirculation loop is uh, the major part of the equipment that would have to be installed uh, 
And so one goal of this tank is to really try to figure out the minimum number of uh, injection nozzles that are needed to perform the uh, neutralizer administration. So this is kind of a, a um, side view of the tank itself. What we see here then is the, again, the uh, filling loop, uh, the filling pump with the piscicide administration unit, and then the recirculation uh, major pump, and then the neutralizer administration pump. And all of the green areas here show, again, the intake from the inside of the tank, there's actually three, only two of which are, or only one of which is pictured here. So this draws water in from the tank, sends it through this pump, and then sends it in through the, um, the injection manifold, which has the 12 nozzles situated there. But what we also see here are ball valves on each of the nozzles. So the nozzles actually penetrate through the tank and inject a high velocity stream of water. The ball valves allow you to select which nozzles of the 12 will be active or inactive at any moment. Just by turning it to the side, you can close off a valve and it effectively inactivate the nozzle. So the ballast tank is intended to perform the following functions. First, it's a 1 24th scale model. So um, all dimensions of the full scale ballast tank, we'll say one foot of the full scale ballast tank corresponds to one half, let's say one foot corresponds to one half inch of the scale model ballast tank. And it happened that the uh, 124th scale gave us a volume of water on the interior of the tank of 500 liters. The calculated fill time for the full scale ballast tank is 315 minutes, which is about five hours and 15 minutes. Um, that would give uh, the smaller ballast tank a time, a filling rate of, well, 1.6 liters per minute if we were filling it in 315 minutes, but we'll actually try to reduce that time. Um, the anti-mycin volume needed um, based on the concentration is about 620 milliliters, and the potassium permanganate is about 31 milliliters. We, at least for preliminary testing, found that we could use citric acid instead, maybe around 730 grams, and then sodium bicarbonate uh, to neutralize that. This would allow one to forego some of the dangers of antimycin and potassium permanganate and use more benign household chemicals as proxies, so to speak, for um, administering the uh, stand-in piscicide and stand-in neutralizer. It would also allow the use of uh, the SANS, um, pH sensors that U.S. Geological Survey uses with regularity to determine the mixing uh, rate or the mixing time of the, uh, the acidic citric acid and then the basic sodium bicarbonate. So uh, the final design, as you can see manufactured here, and even the preceding figure shows uh, the four pumps that were depicted in the solid model shown previously. On the right-hand side, we have the filling and emptying pump. Um, so this is a 12-volt pump that basically draws water from uh, the hose shown here through a flow meter. And so we could say this entire side is at negative pressure draws it through the flow meter, and then injects it to a location that corresponds with the existing location of the um, filling port on the existing full-scale ballast tanks, at least of the Edwin Gott. Now, because this pump draws a vacuum, we put a T-fitting here, that, and, and then a um, ball valve here. There will be an additional needle valve here, such that, um, we can put a container of antimycin or the citric acid here of the desired volume and just connect the pump to that. And we can actually draw in the antimycin or citric acid through the, uh, the vacuum created by the intake of the larger pump just by turning this ball valve here. And if we want to vary the flow rate of that um, valve, then we would use the needle valve, which will be in position when the tests are completed, to vary the rate at which the 
uh, reservoir, you could say, of antimycin A or um, citric acid is drained. So again, the vacuum created by the large pump here will pull fluid in through the small pump, whether the small pump is on or not, uh, and then that can be activated or inactivated by turning the ball valve. And if you want to vary the rate at which the antimycin uh, decreases within that enclosure, then we would use the needle valve to open or close it to either increase or decrease the flow rate. If it happens that the vacuum created by the, um, the filling pump is insufficient to produce the necessary flow rate, then we can augment the flow rate by actually um, powering up the, uh, the smaller antimycin pump shown there and use that to in increase the flow rate of the pump. So what this shows then is the two pumps that would be active in the first phase of, a, of, of the test, that is to say the injection system. We've got a pump for the water to be filling the tank and then a pump for the piscicide, at least if necessary to increase the flow rate. It seems from at least early experiments that this second pump may not be necessary at all as long as we use the vacuum in this line to draw in fluid from um, the antimycin reservoir. Now the second set is the so-called recirculation loop, and this is what you're put into use after the tank is full. So let's envision the tank being full of water treated with antimycin, and this recirculation loop essentially is the same configuration. This is the low pressure side, this is the high pressure side. The water comes in from three different uh, intake ports, um, one located in the middle, one located on the right-hand side, and then the one on the left-hand side isn't shown in the figure. Each of these intake ports have ball valves connected to them. We can see a little bit of one right there. This one's kind of hidden behind the stainless steel pipe, and this one we see the very edge of uh, that. I think it's actually a little further down. So we can turn on and off each of those ball valves and vary the flow pattern that occurs in the tank. We'll see that momentarily. So these three produce the intake to the recirculation loop. And you can see in both cases, there are flow meters showing the actual flow rates, in this case for the filling loop, and in this case for the recirculation loop. And these are situated in a way that they're um, both reading from the intake side uh, as I said, both of these pumps are more or less identical. Um, they draw a vacuum on this side and a pressure on this side, vacuum, pressure. And just like the antimycin uh, circuit, the potassium permanganate pump can also have a reservoir of potassium permanganate or the sodium bicarbonate stand-in uh, if, if necessary. And this, uh, they, it can also make use of the ball valve that's in place and the needle valve that'll be put in place when, when I go up there and kind of add the final parts to it. Um, and essentially what you can do is tap this. It runs through the pump, but it can the vacuum created in this line can pull the um, potassium permanganate, and I think the carrier fluid might be acetone in that case. It can pull it through the pump and pull it straight into the recirculation loop such that you would end up with um, neutralizer-infused water going into this loop. And then we see that the uh, outflow of the recirculation loop comes down to this manifold here. So it comes down, it reaches a T-fitting, and it separates to six nozzles on the left and six nozzles on the right, each of which, again, have these uh, ball valves located on them which allow you to selectively activate them individually such that for the second part of the experiment, one can tune the recirculation loop and figure out what combinations of nozzles are necessary to attain uniform mixing. So uh, to kind of recap the levels of control that the 124th scale model of the ballast tank um, system include, on the one hand, on the right hand side, we've got the uh, adjustable filling pump goes from 0 to 12 volts, and the adjustable piscicide pump going from 0 to 12 volts as well, both of which are contained here. Um, depending on the operating conditions, this 
pump here may not need to be used at all because of the vacuum created in the intake pipeline, intake pump line. Then we've got uh, kind of the second phase of the experiment is just, or the experimental setup is just zero to three intake ports and zero to 12 nozzles. Um, ideally, you'll at least have a minimum of one intake port and a minimum of one nozzle. Um, but here we see then the three intake ports um, located right there, right there, right there. Uh, essentially what happens is the recirculation pump in blue right here pulls a vacuum on the tank and water is drawn in through each of those or whichever of those intake ports are separately activated. It pulls it in, draws it in through the flow meter, which just tells us the flow rate into the pump itself and then pressurized and goes down into the injection, injection nozzle manifold. So here we can see that split. So we've got six nozzles on this side six nozzles on that side, and each of those nozzles has a corresponding ball valve that can be activated or inactivated to figure out which flow pattern would work best for um, the recirculation loop. Now the goal of this is um, to minimize the number of injection nozzles and intake ports needed in the full-scale ballast tank because each of these will cost, you know, a certain amount of money to drill through, install the nozzles, and run piping to it. So we want to minimize the number required to get the job done. Now the last part of this is basically identical to the first uh, two. That is to say a uh, voltage adjustable recirculation pump and a voltage adjustable neutralizer pump. Again, those are these two here. The big one is the recirculation to get the big flow rate, and the smaller one is the neutralizer which is connected on the vacuum end of the pump and may not need to be activated at all, depending on the um, volume flow rate of neutralizer needed to go into the tank. So uh, to give kind of a, a top level view, um, we could say um, this is a depiction of the tank seen from above and from the front of it. If this were the full-scale ballast tank, you'd be standing outside the ship where the water exists and looking at it from above. But uh, this shows all of the valves. I've distinguished the intake ports from the injection nozzles by color and used letters rather than numbers. So these are just simply L for left, M for middle, R for right. Uh, for the intake nozzles, and they don't really show, uh, show them here, but essentially what it would be was water being pulled in. You'd have a ball valve here to activate or inactivate it. It goes into a common manifold um, for the intake, let's say intake manifold. Likewise, another one right here with its ball valve going to here, and then the middle one has a ball valve. This would then go up to the recirculation pump which as we saw is reconnected uh, connected with the um, uh, neutralizer pump and should be able to draw, we'll say the neutralizer from here through the pump in through this, through a ball valve actually connected to the intake side. And then you'd have the neutralizer mixed in with the water on the outflow side. And then the outflow, we again see the um, major outflow manifold for the recirculation loop and the 12 uh, injection nozzles associated with it. Uh, each of these show the, uh, the ball valve kind of in its open position, but we could turn it 90 degrees and close that off to create whatever recirculation pattern we're interested in. So these are just some depictions of some potential recirculation flow patterns that we could use. We could close off the, um, the left and the right uh, intake valves and just activate the central intake valve. And then we could close off um, the injection nozzle two, four, six, um, I guess it was nine and 11. And from that, we would know then that if nozzle one, three, five, eight, 10 and 12 are active, then they're going to inject a stream into the flow. And if only the uh, middle intake port is open, then that flow is going to, uh, those fluids are going to flow toward that middle intake port. Now, another
another uh, injection scenario could be to leave open the left, middle, and right intake, manif uh, intake ports and leave open the first, fourth, fifth, eighth, ninth, and twelfth um, injection manifolds. And by doing that, we would create essentially three separate flow regions. They're all technically interconnected. Uh, but the majority of flow from nozzles one and four would go into this left intake manifold, I mean intake port. Uh, the majority of flow from nozzles five and eight would go into this one, and the majority from nine and 12 would go into that one. So it would uh, essentially create three circulation patterns, uh, so to speak. This is kind of a simplified representation for each of those regions. Now, the biggest goal, as you would understand, is to treat every stagnation region of this tank. And so some of the most concerning, just from a fluid mechanics perspective, would be this stagnation region, all of these regions here. Um, so the regions that don't have a nozzle in front of them, and they don't have an intake manifold in front of them. So this one, this one, uh, this, this, and this. But as I mentioned earlier, the goal really is to figure out the minimum number of nozzles needed to perform um, sufficient mixing to kill the organisms in the enclosure uh, without having to build 12 nozzles. So this allows us, as I said, to set up different flow patterns such that maybe on the final um, design, one could forego nozzles two, three, six, seven, um, 10 and 11, and still get the required mixing to you know, for, uh, ensure the mortality of the, the uh, in, um, creatures in the ballast tank. So this is then a representation of a uh, trial run. Here you'll see nozzle one, 11, and 12 operating, and I believe intakes um, left and middle were operating as well. This was just kind of a demonstration run. But what it's showing is the mixing of the fluid in the tank itself, and then at least some of the blue dye in this case moving over to the intake manifold here. Likewise, the blue dye moving to the intake manifold there. Uh, so this is kind of a experimental part that helps us ascertain that the mixing necessary can be accomplished. And it's just one of many flow patterns that can be generated through uh, appropriate activation of different intake ports and different um, uh, injection manifolds or injection now. So, uh, having done prior research for U.S. Geological Survey, I had done some collaborations with Aaron Cup, and we were infusing carbon dioxide into river locks. And at the time, I had kind of recognized which variables had influence on the mixing time. So, mixing time is a variable that we want to minimize, get it as short as possible. In the case of river locks, um, some of the variables of influence were density of the water in the lock, velocity of the water being injected through the nozzles, diameter of those nozzles, other things like viscosity of the water. And as I said, we were injecting carbon dioxide at the time. So a lot of these variables of density of carbon dioxide, velocity of the carbon dioxide, diameter of the CO2 port, and then concentration, would be replaced with either antimycin, uh, the respective values for antimycin, or um, the same respective values for potassium permanganate. So I'll just write these here. Um, so this is actually kind of a generalized model. It's referred to as so-called similarity um, conditions. But ultimately, what we would do is use these same dimensionless parameters to model the mixing of antimycin in one circumstance and then model the mixing of potassium permanganate in another. Other aspects, as I said, the, the um, ballast tank that we're considering here
is more or less an analogy to the river locks that I had done um, studies on with Aaron Cuff. And so these same equations can be used for both of them um, because they're essentially dimensionless and not so contingent on the um, volume. Uh, but that does uh, require use of the volume itself. In this case, the 500 liters of the tank and then the target concentration of antimycin or potassium permanganate would be used here. The remainder is just gravitational constant. And then the diffusivity of um, antimycin or potassium permanganate into water. And there's a way to measure that. Um, we would just kind of need the appropriate sampling equipment to tell how long it takes antimycin or potassium permanganate levels to reach those, those uh, numbers. So uh, using a principle from fluid mechanics, I non-dimensionalized the variables in this case and essentially came up with 10 dimensionless parameters, most of which are constant or variable just by adjusting the uh, volume flow rate of water through the pump. But four of them end up having a significant influence that, that we'll need to assess uh, during the experiments. And they, in fact, help us um, uh, outline the experiments to ascertain that, indeed, our 1 24th scale um, model to prototype is indeed representative of, of the full scale uh, prototype. So continuing on, just isolating four of the 10 dimensionless parameters, they've got so-called names. Uh, and the first one, I, as far as I can tell, it's a new variable. I call it reduced time. Later, I called it just the Zolfer number. Um, I don't know, as far as I can tell, I identified it. Um, and then the latter are named for uh, really famous uh, I don't know, engineers and scientists, uh, like the Reynolds number, the Sherwood number, and the Froude number which represent um, ratios of inertial to viscous forces, uh, overall diffusion to so-called species diffusion, that is to say our antimycin and potassium permanganate, and then inertial to gravitational forces in the flow. Now, based on the research that I had done with Aaron Cup and Dave Smith of Army Corps of Engineers, um, I had done an analysis of how these dimensionless parameters play out in mixing characteristics, in this case, mixing time. I think this was time to obtain 30% uh, concentration or whatever our, our threshold was for those experiments. And what it allows us to do is essentially show dimensionless relationships, in this case, Reynolds number versus mixing time. Um, the higher the Reynolds number, the higher the so-called reduced time. Now, this can be a little bit misleading because on the one hand, we want time to go low. And one way to do that is to set velocity high. So elsewhere, I've actually plotted mixing time alone just with dimensions of like seconds rather than the product because um, it, by increasing Reynolds number, you're actually decreasing mixing time. But that's not shown here because Reynolds number also has velocity. So if you increase Reynolds number, you have to increase velocity. Um, and so this dimensionless time can be a little bit misleading because it appears as though increasing Reynolds increases mixing time, but that's not actually the case. Uh, the other two parameters are less influential. I'll just briefly mention species diffusion um, in or uh, yeah, Sherwood number, uh, that is to say, increasing the velocity or uh, increasing the diameter or decreasing the diffusion characteristic of the species alters the mixing time. But as I said, mixing time or dimensionless so-called reduced time isn't entirely clear. And the last case, the fruit number, I'll just kind of um, buy as for now. It'll, it'll come into play a little bit later. So um, mixing time, the first of the uh, dimensionless parameters we looked at uh, in for the model, so mixing time for the model and mixing time for the prototype can be related to each other. We just equate the characteristics for the model to the, um, I guess, parameters for the uh, prototype. And so the parentheses indicate all of these are the mixing time, velocity, and diameters, or um, basically dimensions of the model, and these all denote mixing time, velocity, and dimensions for the full-scale prototype, in this case, if we were to put this system on the Edwin Gott. Uh, 
So we can equate those two and then solve. This would be the product of expressions for the prototype shown right there. We want to solve for mixing time. And to do so, we just multiply by the diameter and divide by the um, velocity of the water uh, in the model itself. And we end up with an expression, mixing time of the prototype, velocity of the prototype is 24 um, times velocity of the water in the model. This 24 here comes from the ratio of model velocity to prototype velocity. So the model is 1 24th of the prototype, hence the, the 24 in the denominator. Now if we go on to Reynolds number, we can do the same thing. We can equate the Reynolds number of the model to the Reynolds number of the prototype. And in this case, we want to solve for what velocity the model has to, the water, what water velocity the model has to operate at to attain similarity conditions to the prototype. So we take the Reynolds number from the prototype and we put it here. And then we multiply by viscosity of water, divide by density of water, and then diameter of the water pipes. And what we'll find is the viscosity of the water cancels, the density of the water cancels, and we're left with velocity of the water times the ratio of diameter of the prototype to the model. So this ends up being 24 times, uh, basically the prototype diameter is 24 times greater than the model diameter. So that then tells us that we have to operate the water in the um, model at 24 times the velocity that it would occur in the full-scale prototype. And we can actually take this relationship and substitute in for the earlier term and say then that for the mixing time of the model to be similar, you know, equivalent to that of the prototype, um, we substitute our 24 times our, our velocity of the model is equal to 24 velocity of the prototype. So we get 24 times 24. And we say that, or we conclude then that the mixing time in the model represents 1 576th of that of the prototype. So if the mixing can be done in the model tank in one minute, then it will take 576 minutes for that to occur in the in the full scale Edwin Guy. So uh, the model tank itself is designed for four types of tests. One is the pisocide administration. Uh, another is the neutralizer nozzle optimization that I kind of discussed earlier, just showing flow patterns. And then uh, neutralizer administration, setting the right flow rates for the neutralizer. And then the last is new, um, mortality studies, which are a little outside of the uh, range of my experience. Um, it's worth noting that these first three can be performed with pisocide neutralizer proxies, that is to say maybe citric acid and sodium bicarbonate, or they can even be done independently with dyes like rhodamine. And I know that um, the SANS, at least SANS I've worked with, them. Uh, so these can be done, um, you know, with fairly benign chemicals and maybe allow one to limit the amount of um, uh, personal protective equipment needed to perform the experiments by the technicians. Meanwhile, the mortality studies do have to make use of the actual antimycin and um, potassium permanganate. So we'll just kind of start off with an overview is these um, Proxy chemicals like citric acid, sodium bicarbonate, and uh, rhodamine are all able to be detected by SANS. Um, the citric acid, sodium bicarbonate just require the pH sensor, and then uh, rhodamine would require the rhodamine sensor. Uh, as far as I know, I'm not real familiar with antimycin or potassium permanganate, but I think these require something of a pipette to take samples from the different areas. Now, um, if I had the ability, I would ask for the entire tank to be thoroughly instrumented, but I know that that ends up getting fairly expensive. Um, so my suggestion would be to place SANS at least at these locations, um, and then ideally at some of these locations as well. Uh, really, all of these voids would kind of be ideal. As I mentioned earlier, if these are the regions where minimal mixing would occur, and so these would be the regions where some potential invasive species could hide out.
and then escape when the tank is later drained. Um, but nonetheless, sounds in those locations or uh, sampling through pipettes all would be kind of acceptable methods. Now to outline the first method, we'd have to uh, do piscicided administration. And so we'd start with just an empty tank. We'd place the sands or the sampling um, pipettes into the recommended positions. And then we would set the water pump, the large pump, to fill the tank with water in 12 to 25 minutes. 12.5 uh, is uh, exactly 500 minutes, I think, divided by um, 24, if I recall correctly. Or I think 300 minutes divided by 24, actually. And then if, if necessary, we could extend the time if the pump isn't able to attain that flow rate. Uh, and then in discussions with Gavin Sari, we kind of concluded that based on the half-life of antimycin, we would inject it at the latter half of the filling time. So either uh, 6.25 minutes into this scale model flow or 12.5 minutes into the scale model flow, both of which are essentially half, um, half the uh, time. So the latter half of the filling time of the tank and this is based on the half-life of the antimycin and the filling time of the full-scale tank. Um, and then I would hope that uh, continuous readings of the concentrations of the uh, active chemicals or the proxies would be able to be taken for the stagnation zones for the duration of the test. So if, uh, if uh, centric acid were uh, being used in this case, we just measure the pH uh, through the sons for the duration of the test and then let it continue running. You know, in theory, you could figure out what the uniform concentration would be for a given dose of citric acid, or um, at least if you run it long enough or allow it to sit long enough, you should attain the uniform concentration. And from that, you can say, you know, what's the concentration of this specific sound with respect to the concentration of the tank after a certain time and use that to set, um, determine the time it takes to attain that concentration. That would be your T mixing for the antimycin. Moving on to neutralizer nozzle optimization. It's kind of what I described before. Uh, in this case, though, begin with the full tank. You could have it already treated with citric acid and then apply the neutralizer, or in theory, you could just come with um, neutral water and uh, run citric acid through the nozzle system, the recirculation loop. Um, but in any case, just place the sons and samplers in position and then open or close the ball valves on the intake ports and injection nozzles that you wanna use. So, Let's say we want to activate nozzles 1, 4, 5, 8, 9, and 12. That would mean close nozzle 2, close nozzle 3, close nozzle 7, uh, 6 and 7, close nozzle 10 and 11. And likewise, in this case, all of the intake ports would be open, so we would just kind of leave those as they are. Then we'd set the pump to the maximum power, just the maximum that it can handle, and uh, kind of leave it at that and then open the ball valve to the potassium permanganate or citric acid or sodium bicarbonate. We'll say after one minute or so, noted on the SANS log such that you can say whatever the time that uh, that occurred would be the time that um, you would have to uh, say the injection began and then record the concentrations in the stagnation zones for the duration of the test. And then I would suggest we continue recording and continue operating the pump until homogeneity is reached. That is to say, until a uniform concentration is read at all of the signs. Uh, then finally, the neutralizer administration. It's after one identifies the optimum combination of intake, um, intake ports, oops, not that, uh, intake ports, uh, so left, middle, and right, and the optimum combination of nozzles then use that combination, which everyone uses, attains the lowest mixing time, use that combination to do the neutralizer administration. In this case, it's a very similar approach, but you'd use the singular, maybe one or two sets of combinations. Uh, open the appropriate valves, ports, and nozzles. Uh, set the recirculation pump to maximum power for the first run and say run it for 10 minutes. 
open the potassium permanganate valve, uh, ball valve again, and one minute into the test and noted on the SANS log, and then record the concentrations at the stagnation zones. And then thereafter, one can vary the power going to the recirculation pump um, and the power going to the potassium permanganate pump and use that to hone in on the optimum operating conditions that would be used for the full-scale installation, say on the Edwin Gott, and from that then um, uh, use that to size the pumps for the Edwin Gott or you know, other equivalent similar vessels. Now the last one is the mortality studies, which to my understanding may be conducted at uh, Lake Superior Research Institute. And so in these cases, you'd have to use the antimycin and potassium permanganate as proposed. Uh, in such case, then you'd start with an empty ballast tank, um, place the sounds and samplers in position, open and close valves on ports and nozzles for the best mixing condition, um, set the filling pump to fill the tank with organism filled water, um, probably a sample from the bay or with uh, very specific uh, species, I think I've heard Daphnia are, are commonly used, and have it set up to fill in 12 to 25 minutes. Open the ball valve to antimycin A after six to 12 minutes, kind of as mentioned earlier, and then stop the fill pump when the tank is full. Now this would necessitate a break um, because on the one hand we are using scale model, 124th scale operating conditions and times um, corresponding to the 124th scale. Um, but in order to enact effect mortality of the, um, the test organisms, you would need to expose them for whatever duration is necessary for uh, antimycin to have its effect. And I, I think in talking to Gavin Sari, uh, that was of the order of um, maybe three to five hours, if I recall correctly. And then thereafter, we would apply the neutralizer, and that would be done by starting the recirculation pump, the big pump on the recirculation loop, uh, running it for 10 minutes and then opening the valve with the potassium permanganate after one minute and then continuing to sample the stagnation region shown in the orange circles um, for you know on minute intervals or some intervals or something like that to ascertain that i guess the neutralizer has its effect uh, so to kind of summarize everything that we, we went through on this, we designed a 124th scale model um, ballast tank, and that allows kind of two types of scale. One is the scaling of the velocity of the water itself. So um, we were able to say 124th of the 300 minutes needed to fill the tank, that is to say five hours. Uh, would give us 1 24th, um, would give us 12.5 minutes for filling time. And then I think it was roughly um, four hours or 240 minutes needed to treat the tank. And so at 1 24th of that would require 10 minutes to actually perform it. So those are the velocities um, that arise from the scaling factors that we saw in the similarity conditions. But then mixing time itself is kind of another creature. Um, that actually is a factor of 1 24th scaled, so 1 576th of the full scale. And that then means that whatever times are measured to attain the required concentration, um, their mixing time really, uh, correspond to 1 576 of the time that it would take on the full scale vessel. Um, so these are two different kind of scaling factors, both based on 124th, but one is a time scale and then one is a velocity scale. And then mortality itself, uh, we wouldn't expect any changes to occur on the target species um, with respect to the antimycin. So three hour treatment time on the model corresponds to three hour treatment on the full scale. So I hope this is uh, informative. I, I will be available to answer questions related to the test as well, um, but hopefully this at least gives um, any technicians